Okay, this this is Barry. I'm not sure if you all can see or hear me. We can see you. We can okay. hear you. Okay, that's a good start. <laughs> so uh, again, this is another episode in our continuing webinars on, you know, how to help landscapers be more eco-friendly and you know learn more things. And it's not just about products; it's about processes. And um, there will also be some other people, not tonight, but talking more about the why we should be doing this. So anyway, um, we had Mike on last year. He, he's located in Canada. He runs a landscape company up there. Uh, he's been doing it for quite a while and he's, he's transitioned from you know, doing it um, synthetically into what's now what he calls a, a regenerative system. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mike. Great. Thank you, Barry. I uh, want to welcome everyone here tonight or in the future, those who are looking. And basically, what I'm going to be talking about is building soil health for healthy landscapes using regenerative land practices. I um, started back in 1981 at the age of 16. I'm 58 this year, so it's been 43 years. Uh, this truck I bought in uh, 85, the fall of the... Uh, 84 to 85 and uh, the guys who put the tank on Rittenhouse sprayers up our end took pictures of it and I still have that truck today that's just a personal driver but you can see the the actual name of the company was Stangles Lawn Spray and now we're called Stangles Enviral Lawn Care and so we'll start let me know if I can there we go okay as I was mentioning we we're established in 1981 you know, at the age of 16, it was a no brainer for me. You know, my dad bought a bag of fertilizer and we just applied it. And uh, it seemed very simple at the time. You know, the consumers, as we now know, are pre-sold on expectations and on a schedule. So we were actually at the time applying five applications a year, three fertilizers, granular and two weed sprays. And in the middle of that would have been a chinch bug uh, towards August, uh, insect into September, for grubs. You know, the expectations are based on their experiences, you know, these experiences, sorry. Fertilizer, it turns green and it grows fast. So the consumers today are basing their experience on past expectations or past experiences of fertilizer applications. And that's basically what we call the conventional system today. You know, we spray by schedule based upon consumer demand. So as soon as April comes around, as you saw, a lot of lawn care companies are out there right now fertilizing. As soon as May comes around, a herbicide would go on. June would be another fertilizer. July would be a summer inspection, upsell. August would be a herbicide into uh, insecticide for us up this end with grubs and into um, grubs into September with a fertilizer. And we were basically finishing off in October. So we were a five application uh, company. And you can see in this picture on the bottom, I didn't like wearing gloves and I was spraying Durasban this, uh, this day. Picture on the top, you can see I've got a glove on my right hand holding the hose and you sweat. I do have wear a respirator and I did at the time. Um, and I just found that it was more convenient not to wear a glove on my spray hand and I kept everything clean, but how clean really was it? You know, we spray herbicides to kill off weeds. We sprayed insecticides to kill insects. We sprayed fungicides to control disease. And it all added up for me suicide. And it literally was taking a toll on me. Uh, as for toxicity, it is the applicator who's going out there, who's getting the cocktail effect. It's not the homeowner to a per se or the puppy because Yes, there's multiple homes in the neighborhood are getting it, but at the same time, if I'm going out in that truck, I was spraying 100,000 square feet a day. Uh, and that's what that split tank was set up for. And so you can see how milky white that was, that was Dura's fan, and that's why I was wearing a respirator. Uh, it wasn't fun. You know, I was building up a toxicity within, and by the day's end, I was dizzy, and my dilated pupils, and that was just, four or five years in, and I just couldn't see or understand why I, we had to use this stuff other than the consumer and my ego wanting to grow the business more. 
you know, and for that reason, in about 18, 1989, I actually started introducing organics, but the science and the products weren't of age. They were actually very costly. I used uh, a product called Sustain, which is poultry manure um, in uh, Vigoro's products. We were using uh, sugars at that time, corn sugar, molasses. We were using Kool-Aid to mask our smells, but the sugars were for the bacteria itself. So that was my first introduction to it, but I was only doing it because it was an out had an outcome of breaking down something, specifically thatch, or covering the smell of the product. You know, our philosophy in lawn care is basically in the conventional system, it's all the same. The only thing that changes is the company name and what they charge. They go out with the same philosophy and they spray and spray and spray. You know, even with chemicals back in the day, uh, we lost customers. We still lose customers today too, because based on their expectations, based upon past outcomes of fertilizer, they just don't understand. And the ones who do understand are more than happy to go with us. As long as they're seeing, um, outcomes uh, and experience that they can grasp as green. You know, and there you go, expectations are based upon marketing and past results. So when we got uh, marketing, especially in the MLB, you got Scott's fertilizer, the consumer's gonna be going, hey, give me some of that Scott's. Up here in Canada and Ontario, we have a ban on herbicides since 2009. So people, until you know COVID had hit, we're going across the river, which is just going into New York State from us over the Niagara River and picking up the good stuff. And then the good stuff to them is a herbicide, a chemical 240 decamba. And in some respect, it did what it's supposed to have done, but at the same time, uh, yeah, I just won't use it anymore personally myself. Uh, we do have a lot of customers in the Niagara region who go across the river and just do that. What we call this approach is the moron approach. You know, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> when they had more weeds all, or insects, all we did was just spray more of the stuff on. You know, when it was not growing fast enough, we just fertilized more. And, and we continually put more on with no intellect for a happy, smiling customer who will just pay. And that's what we were looking for. So that, that's what we call the moron approach. It took no intellect. I can train monkeys to do my job. But when I went regenerative, oh man, it, you got you to gotta use your noodle. And it, and it makes it more entertaining too at the same time. At that time, I know I was mentioning the berry, we've got 2 million square feet right now per month. We were doing over 6 million square feet uh, per month. And that was from a five, and then I went into a seven apps and into the late 2000s. We were at 6 million uh, square feet. We were doing over 1,500 customers. I had nine guys, multiple trucks, and it really became a headache. At the end of the day, it wasn't fun anymore. And I had to, yeah, I had to reel back. I had to really start thinking about me, uh, my wife, the kids were going to be coming soon enough. And so what I was doing was I was looking at why weeds grew. And so I went into the ag industry. And it seems that the ag industry is so much farther ahead with us in this regenerative movement or organics, but they understood what the weed was. And the weed is an actual outcome. They're from uh, our poor management, basically fertilizing herbicides, but more so when they build the house, before that house was there, it was probably a farm and all those disturbances had disturbed the soil to the point where there's no organic matter, there's so much compaction. And then when they build that house, you got engineering codes that they have a specific compaction ratings around the house. And then if you didn't know, uh, turf grass and most plants don't like anything over 300 PSI, they can't break that compaction barrier. They're down at the 200 PSI, if not a little lower, not a little higher, they gotta do that Goldilocks. They like that nice area. When you get to 300, you get that hard pan in there. You get the water going down. It sets and it starts filling up. And now you get alcohols, real high. You get all these nasty things starting to go anaerobic. And roots won't go down anymore. They'll just go sideways. So basically, the weed's not the problem. 
It was how we were managing it. Weeds are plant diversity. So we got to look at it as an education to the consumer to get off the word weed and get on to plant diversity. Plants only grow specifically to what the biology's chemistry is putting out. And so let me go back to that one. Weeds are plant diversity called into action based on the soil, dirt, life, and chemistry it makes. Soil is living and dirt is dead. So with dirt, we have a lot of it around every home and it's so compacted. Uh, so with that, you get anaerobic, you get different chemistries, you get um, smells that you've never smelt before, especially ammonia. So again, with the plant diversity, every plant has a story, you gotta figure out why. And I should just go back to that. So that book, When Weeds, Weeds uh, Talk with Jay, I got to talk to him last year for a good hour. And uh, that's what happens when you go regenerative. You basically are very open to talking to everybody. And Jay was great to talk to. And then as I was going through my conversation, telling him what I'm doing, because even though I've been doing it for 43 years, I want to know more and I want to do what I'm doing better. And so when I was talking to Jay, his first thing that he mentioned was, I'm not talking enough about carbon. And we'll get to the carbon part about it. And I got to see your um, talk with Chip and Chip was mentioning about the carbon too. And, and it's very important to really talk, get carbon back into your soil. So again, every plant has a story of why it grows. The primary job is to proliferate. That's why the customer is not happy. One, the marketing from Scott's at one point was that they put clover in all their uh, seed mix. And then after the Second World War, we found out that Macroprop would kill off that clover. Uh, 240 was for the dandelions and the stubborn wheat we had the Tecamba. Long and short, they started getting into the herbicide mix and we started losing the fact of what clover was supposed to be doing. And yes, clover had sometimes IDs that you've got low nitrogen in the soil. It's a nitrification plant, it's a legume. It's pulling nitrogen from the atmosphere. And just for uh, fun sakes, there's over four square feet is a skid. You've got nine tons of actual nitrogen over every four square feet of free fertilizers or nitrogen sitting there. All we're lacking is the biology to actually sequester it and pull it in. And at the same time, we think it's all got to go through the root. And as I know you've had James White on, it's not the case. It goes through the root and plus on the leaf. And the rhizophagy cycle is more in the root, root eating. But when we look at the leaf, the biology, the same essence of the rhizophagy is happening on the leaf. So there is excreting out ecudates, feeding the biology there, and then drawing them back in. Not so much through the stomata, but through the leaf itself. Now, when we look at the, the proliferation of these plants, at the end of this season, some of them are biannual or others are going a couple of years, the plants will die. The roots that have broken up some of that compaction will die off, turn into organic matter. Not only that, that the worms, the microarthropods, the beetles, they'll start eating, excrementing, nutrient cycling, and then on the top, you get a debris field. And again, the beetles, the microarthropods, <laughs> worms will they continually uh, feed the soil. And specifically, like this dandelion is looking for a lot of calcium right now. And at this time of year, a lot of potassium comes available with the rains. If you did get rain, we're getting lots up here. And we're going to get a lot of push on weeds that love potassium. And so if we can balance that, I'm still trying to figure out how to do that, um, <laughs> we can actually reduce the influx of the weeds that are coming up. As I was mentioning here in the fourth uh, thing, they then die feeding the worm, da, 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 and as well as leaving avenue for the uh, water and air to move easily downward. And again, that's about the root and the specific roots. If you get into um, plantains, you get into uh, these dandelions, and even with taproot, you got high compaction. And these roots are going to go scavenge for your minerals. They're going to pull the minerals up, specifically calcium from down deep, bring it up, die off again, releasing it and trying to flocculate the soil. But not, calcium can't just flocculate because the fact is that you need the fungus. 
And this dandelion plant here, it's a start of the mycorrhizal. It's a lower species and it's a mycorrhizal plant. We just didn't know that. Uh, for the fact that it's there, it's, how do I say, like uh, photosynthesizing, sending exudates, and encouraging the soil to successfully move forward. So another way I look at weeds are they're their suntan lotion. If you got a bare spot, a weed will grow quick, dependent upon the temperature, the biology, and the chemistry. And what would we do in the hot sun? I didn't do that today. I put suntan lotion on to protect my skin and the soil will actually grow a plant to proliferate to continue the health of the soil moving forward successfully. So it'll grow a weed to protect its soil from the sun. So the plant will actually create exudates through photosynthesis. Oh. So fast forward in 2014-15, I was taking courses and I got to meet Elaine Ingham, and I did take her course, uh, both uh, the Soil Food Web and the Microscope Intensive course. And before that, I got to meet Graham State and Joel Williams. Um, Joel just lives up the street from us now here, but they were here in Canada, and I got to go up to Guelph University, and I got to take the course there. And there was a lot of aha moments. And that's when I really decided to flip the entire business. So 2009, we had a pesticide ban. We had to go some type of organics. We had different materials up here. I just didn't like any of them for herbicide because of the impact on the, the applicator or me. And at the end of the day, after talking to Elaine, conversing with her and many others, I figured in 2015, I flipped my entire company and went regenerative, didn't tell the customers, we just did it. I went cold turkey. I went from 1,500 customers down to 200. I went from 6 million, but to 2 million. I kept all of the, the best uh, the customers we've got. We got wineries, uh, we've got sport fields, and I'll get more into that. But again, what I say in the last point here, courses are the fundamental for current science and opportunities. And it was that opportunity of meeting Elaine and Graham St. and Joel that really awoken me to understand that the, the biological, and at the time that the regenerative was just coming up, it was more biological we were using term, was the way to go to get away from the chemistry and chasing numbers as one would say. Mm -hmm. So in 2019, I started going to all these conferences and I got out to the no-till in Plains in Kansas. And I got to meet uh, David Johnson, his wife, uh, as you can see, I've got Christine Jones, Chris Nichols, David Montgomery, and his wife, Anne, Grant, Sims. There were so many. It was a Comic-Con for all the science and everybody who was doing something. And when I got down there, I got to uh, talk to everyone, pick their brains. And I was the only lawn care guy in an ag conference. And I do not go to any lawn care conference ever because all they're going to do is try to sell you something. <laughs> I go to these guys because they bring the science to the table and the science has been working. So David's been working on his Johnson suit since uh, 2009, 2008, way back when. Uh, I started working with it in 2017, 18. And we're in our fifth year of using the Johnson Sioux as an extract, which I say is priceless. And I still continue to take courses. I know Nicole Masters. I took Ag 101, uh, Kiss the Ground. Uh, I, I've done everything. And literally, the reason I do it is because not one person is going to give you all the information. And everybody's so individualized, meaning me, that I can't gravitate or resonate with everybody and all that information. I just chew, cherry pick, literally, and what works for me in this industry. And so, when I go to a conference, you get to hear the, their whole 20, 30 years of residence in science or what they've been doing on the farm. And what I liked about the farm also was the fact that when a farmer is planting a crop, a good farmer has 40 years and it's only one crop a season. And then he's taken that one season going into the next season and trying to expand out into the next. He's got 40 years 
and then he's finished. I'm 43 and I'm still trying to figure it all out. And a lot of right now with regenerative, you're getting two, three, four, five crops in a season out of a field now, rather than just the one. And that's what I learned from David and the farmers, whereas observation, we really got to start observing more. And I think we all do. It's just that nobody's ever told me, Mike, you got to observe more. You got to write document. We've always documented, but not to the point we are doing now. So, and then we know plants farm biology as we all had, you've had James on. And I got to talk to James quite a few times last year and in depth and figuring stuff out. And then we, we know biology lives in the soil and in the plant and on the plant. And the rhizophagy is an important cycle uh, for the endophytes. And so I create a lab serum, which is lactose bacillus, and I'll get that into it. And within it, I'm making, um, I put, uh, instead of just rice within my water, I put the grass seed in. And then the grass seed, what I'm trying to do is pull those endophytes out. And we're gonna make an inoculum that is specific to the grass. And what I did was over this past winter, I studied up endophytes and I found out there's generic endophytes for specific plants. And Fusarium is an actual endophyte. And it's only in check by a quorum of bacteria. So Fusarium is actually a positive within the soil. It's not always a negative. It's only a negative when we unbalance the soil through a disturbance. Again, the Goldilocks principle, you, you can have both, both worlds, but you just got to find the right, like I can use some fertilizer, but you don't want to use too much. I can use some herbicide, but you don't want to use too much. But I, again, I don't use any herbicides. And the last point is we need to be able to measure, and I like the microscope personally, because I can really see what is in the soil and what is what my outcomes are coming to going to be. Do I have enough bacteria, Do I have enough fungus? What kind of fungus or bacteria? Do I have the protozoa in there? What kind of protozoa? Do I have uh, like arthropods? Do I have nematodes? What kind of nematodes? And then this picture is a root and that's a mycorrhizal from one of our grass plants that you can see the, uh, the fungus going through into the root. So we do get mycorrhizal. That's another point I'm just thinking. Uh, I was talking to a, a professor out of Ottawa from France. He was on our property last year, checking out our market guard and then going up to the, I work with uh, farmers too. So we're on a cash crop of corn. Mycorrhizal, you don't necessarily need an inoculum when the food sources are, or the disturbances are to the point where, uh, it's too abundant or too in, in, invasive, that fungus will sporulate. And so you do have uh, mycorrhizal spores sitting there and they're floating around. So you're always getting an inoculation. You could inoculate. I still do at certain points to speed up the whole process, but it's the quorum. And the quorum is basically the signals called autoinducers from the biology that will actually set up the entire soil, which means the root will migrate through the soil. And as the root becomes or gets near that spore, the mycorrhizal will actually become active and do its job. And you'll get a hundred to 500 time fold in the root mass by that mycorrhizal because of the mycelia being so fine, it can get into spots far greater than a root can. I go into too much depth, just let me know. So this picture here is of dead dirt. This is of someone who fertilized their lawn. We took a sample of it. He loves his lawn. He's got no weeds and his grass grows and he's got to put excessive amounts of water on and it dries out in the summertime. That's atypical. So, you know, it starts before the homes and I was mentioning that the disturbances that are caused basically are from the farm where they scrape the land, they produce a neighborhood and then they bring the crap back and they spread it over and then they have uh, compaction ratings and then they throw sod on and you need the fertilizers just to get the grass to survive. So what happens when you have open soil? Organic matter oxidizes, it goes into the atmosphere, CO2. Also, when you put fertilizer on, if you didn't know, for every microgram of nitrogen you put on, 
the bacteria is going to eat five micrograms of uh, organic matter, which is carbon. And that's your currency exchange for fast growing grass. And as it, it eats that organic matter, which took space and blows it off as CO2, it compacts. And so your compaction rating gets up and that changes these, um, the biology from say a, an aerobic to a facultative to anaerobic more. And then you'll get different chemistries, which means we're gonna signal for weeds to grow. Other than that, I didn't mention anything about insects and disease, but I'll signal for insects and disease for the fact you don't have enough organic matter. It's gonna wipe out your crop or your plant which is grass, and it's going to produce more organic matter, which is one it needs more carbon. And that's where basically organic matter was the cushion, now it's depleted, it creates compaction, changes chemistry, plant diversity, weeds grow, fix, build organic matter, soil, health, and life. So dead dirt observations. You get increased plant diversity, and again, try to use plant diversity when you're talking to your customers or people rather than weeds. Right away, when I say the word weeds, you guys already have a picture. If you say plant diversity, I've got to educate you on what that means. Increased insects, disease, inputs, water, evaporation, gassing off, increased environmental damages and more. We now know that if we put a fertilizer on your lawn, an insect, a herbicide, or a fungicide on, that it goes beyond the border that we put it on. It's either gassing off or move mobile with the rain or the watering. And it's going beyond and it's going downstream and it's going into your lakes, as you all know, into your dead zones in the ocean, streams, uh, little Janie's dogs picking it up off the paws. That's why I literally changed this back in when my first uh, child was born in 2001. I stopped spraying my lawn. And with that, I said, I was a hypocrite. <laughs> and I was still spraying everyone else with a child. And I had to migrate away from that. And so back then I actually went into IPM, integrated pest management, as you know, but I just spot treated. And I went to five fertilizers and I spot treated all the way along with an actual herbicide, a three-way mix, uh, 240 Mecaprop the Camba. And we put sugars in with it in a sticking agent. We try to reduce our, the amount of product we use. And at the time when we started uh, just for fun, it was only 25 cents a thousand when we were spraying uh, herbicides on a lawn. That's why we did it back in the 80s. It was very cheap and cost effective. So I was mentioning this right here is where we work. Uh, we got our own microscope. We do our own uh, analysis a biomass ratio. We're looking for a one-to-one -one ratio. We have quite a few homes at the one-to-one, -one, and yet we still have a few weeds because you're not going to be perfect. I still get a pimple if I eat too much chocolate, right? And that's, that's an outcome. So anywhere we get snow, we get that buildup of snow on the turf. You're going to have a high impact from the melt. So you're going to have too much moisture, not enough air, or you got the high impact of the salts that they're using. So you're going to have areas that are always being disturbed. Excuse me. So it's easy enough to take a core sample. And actually, this is we're looking at my brew right now. There's a, a measuring cup there. That's my extract. And we would look at our extract every morning. But it's easy enough to take a, a sample of the soil or the dirt, look at it underneath the microscope, and see where you're really at. And you really should start looking for fun, through a microscope. We do workshops here and we help a lot of farmers uh, understand and how to use these microscopes. And in the process, like I was mentioning, I started building the Johnson Sioux Bioreactor in 2018. I got to meet David in 2019. And in that time, we've, we've been talking quite conversely back and forth. Uh, finding out new ways, not new ways, but new information for me to lend to the farmers locally. And so I use the leaves in the fall. It's easy enough to build. I just use leaves. I was, I'm reading a book right now, and it's funny enough that if we look at the forest or our trees, when the leaves fall, that's the fertilizer for the next season. They're a very fungal dominated um, plant, like the leaf would be fungal dominated. And what I found was we do get really dominated fungus uh, within this uh, bioreactor. 
And then once the food source, that's the bottom left picture, it turns into a dark compost. Once the food source is actually exhausted, the, the fungus, the mycelium was sporulate. So we use a mic, uh, I'm sorry, a hemotoptometer, which we use for uh, calculating uh, for blood. We use it for counting uh, spores. And then we find out how many spores that we're gonna be putting up per square foot so we can actually figure out how much uh, compost I have to use per acre. And literally, I'm, I'm using two pounds per acre right now uh, of that. And at the end of this uh, process, after 60 weeks, I'm actually have close to 350 to 400 pounds of compost. That's a lot of acres I can actually do. I do three a year. Um, so I have three right now that I built in the fall, <laughs> excuse me, that are ready for 2024. And in 2022, no, 2021, I'm using now for 2023. So you do have to have um, some thought about it. There is a process here. You can make other compost or buy other people's compost. I was making um, compost the way Elaine Ingham was doing it. I personally, it took a lot of my energy and time. This, I put it in a container. I leave it in my garage. My irrigation turns on once a day for 30 to 40 seconds. I leave it for weeks. I come back and it looks like that. That's a no brainer for me. I just don't have the energy to start flipping and within six months have something available for me. So we have a product we call Nature's Brew, which is the extract of that compost. I make one here every morning. Last year, we got up to a thousand. We're over a thousand fifty right now. So basically I get the compost, I wash it out. And I have a video online if you want to go see that. Uh, I get all the life out of it and then I discard or put it back in the other bioreactor, the leftovers. I add humic, fulvic, and kelp, yucca, fish, and other minerals to feed the biology within the extract as well as the plant. You need that plant to send out more exudates to feed the biology. So basically, you've got to be doing a few things here. So you, you really do have a witch's brew or I call it nature's brew. Uh, people think I actually uh, create teas and I don't, I would not recommend teas by far. Don't go near teas, just make an extract. Extracts are the easiest and simplest. 30 to 40 minutes, you're done. And it's in that truck and it's going out the door and it's being sprayed. Um, so what do we got? This excites photosynthesis, increasing the next few days for the soil. We just said all that, perfect. One of the words I learned in the last couple of years from the farmers is the word pivot. And pivot to me was pivotal for the fact if I didn't like what I saw, it was easy enough to pivot in a direction to push for an outcome that the consumer really wanted. Uh, but at the same time, I had to understand that the impacted outcome had to have a benefit in the soil. So I started this year using the Haney, the PLFA, and the TND, which can tell me a lot. And I use uh, Lance uh, Gunderson at Regen Ag Lab, uh, which is, I met him down in December in Iowa at the big soil health event with Rick Haney, Liz Haney, and everyone else. Again, it was a huge uh, conference and it was a fun one. I brought the guy with me, Wesley, that works with me, who does all my microscopy. Um, we got to meet everybody, we got to talk, and again, learn so much. You know, if we see roots feeding nematodes, and that's what, we're, you know, with the, uh, with the microscope, we can pivot. We can actually put an extract on because in our extract, we have predatorial nematodes. The picture up here is a bacteria feeding one. And again, this uh, bottom picture is a mycorrhizal root. If we see ciliates, and ciliates are not that bad, you don't mind some ciliates because you're going to have that anaerobic to aerobic and facultative is in the middle. And that just means uh, the facultative have two enzymes. They can live in both an anaerobic and uh, aerobic. You're going to have that all the time, no matter where you are on your property. And, you know, and if we need to enhance the outcome, we can pivot. And that's what I was mentioning with our product. So if we needed to put a little boron, 
a uh, little iron or something like that, uh, calcium nitrate, uh, AMS right now, ammonia sulfate. I'm using some of that for the sulfur. Uh, I'm mixing lab serum in with it. And the, the lactose bacillus is changing the nitrate into amino acids. And see, this is what you learn when you start going to ag industries, these things that you would never learn in, in an atypical lawn care convention. They, they, I don't know, they just try to sell you a spur or a spreader or something. So I'm regenerative. You can see one of my spore fields here. There's some dandelions there. You're not gonna be rid of it. The kids are beating the crap out of it. Um, the right picture there, that's a rooftop winery. I rebuilt that for them last year. Uh, I've been taking care of it, but they weren't taking care of it when I was telling them what we should be doing. So I rebuilt it for them. Just there the other day, looks really good. Uh, they're going to have another stage, uh, another uh, roof going off the back end there. That's the north side. If we look farther than those trees, that's Toronto on the other side of there. The bottom picture is uh, Peller. I've been here for 25 years on this property. I've been with Trius for 30. I've been with the St. Lawrence Seaway. I take care of the locks from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. And I've been there for 30 plus years. I've got a lot of customers and I, I maintain these ones. And you can see that... The football field's the only one with weeds. The rest of them are pretty good. The the winery, though, does have a, a few dandelions, crabgrass up along the edge because they like to use salt over the winter to keep the consumer, their uh, guests, um, ice-free. And then they have skirts on the far side there that they like to do tours up to the, the vineyard and they come back. So again, I like the third point, and I learned that from Rick Haney. You make your own playbook. There's really not one playbook for everybody, you literally, and you, you, but you don't have to go this through alone, right? Because you can look to each other for Q and A. And I found that lawn care industry is one of the snobbiest industries up here in Canada. They don't like to talk to each other. They don't like to share information, uh, but yet you talk to a farmer, they'll tell you anything. Uh, they'll, we'll sit down and we'll have a beer, coffee, uh, water, wherever four or five of them, and they'll just start jogging along with the conversations and we'll figure some stuff out. I belong to the Soil Health Network here in Ontario and they're all farmers. I'm the only lawn care guy in it, but I brought them the microscope and they're really intrigued with it. Um, and so that's why I keep saying, or what I've said is that if you can get the microscope, it's fun, it's not hard to learn. And at the same time, you can take a sample, look at it right away and you'll be fascinated. When we started doing this in 2015, I was on it every day, an hour, hour and a half. And I can look at it now, but I just don't have the time. That's why I hired Wesley in 2014 out of a, a school who knows how to do it a lot better than I. And like I said there down there, even I lose customers based on their unrealistic expectations. And that's what we're faced with these days is unrealistic expectations based on past experiences with fertilizer and sprays. And it, you can't flip those people you can plant the seed like an ag or in lawn care, plant a seed and hope it changes and grows and, and then they'll come back to you. Uh, for fun, um, we had a customer who just came on. Uh, he was over $4,000 in account that, and he brought his whole family on and he had my ad from two years ago and he saw some results on others and he finally came on and, and said, you know what, I wanna go your route because I was with uh, Green Lawn, Chem Lawn, True Green, whatever the, the name is up here. Uh, and they didn't want the fertilizer anymore. And both sides of them, I was there today, have fertilized lawns, dark green and growing. But you have to understand there's a currency exchange. The currency exchange is losing the organic matter for the fast growth, which means compaction, which means weed, which means you're on that treadmill to spray. The other is that we now know that over 70% of what we put on is either gassing off or moving off. So return on investment is very low. As I was mentioning in the last point, 43 years, I'm still here. I'm finding fun again in this job. Sometimes it's aggravating. Other times it's, it's just pure bliss. I, I When I get to these sites and I'm just uh, applying my uh, pelletized compost uh, and I know what I'm getting, like, okay, we're, yeah, we're online. So one of the uh, NHL players, they're going to have a wedding here in June from the Toronto Maple Leafs. I've got to get this ready. The granddaughter for the owners having a wedding. So we've got all of these things. These accounts 
are not little accounts. This is 100,000 square feet. I got 12 sport fields. Um, again, it, it is fun now. Now, when you go regenerative, and you, because you're working with soil and lawns, you can go right over to the crops. And there's a picture here up at the top with the grapes. I'm working with a guy last year on a Niagara Lake, and that's a regenerative. We're working with ground covers. We're looking at the plant. We're using our product. We're teaching him how to use it. The thing is that you become a consultant there, and you're getting some money for it, but you're not making a hell of a lot. I would say, you know, you're going to have fun doing that because it's outside of the norm. Here's our customer up here to the right saying goodbye to the chemicals and coming with us. That was June 20th. She's been with us eight years now. She's still with us. And she's, we've got her down to four applications. We were doing one application a month from April to September. And we're minimum $66. Plus I put some calcium in another six. So we're at $71 per application times seven. We got to eat guys and girls. I mean, you can't do five applications at 30 bucks. The first one's half off. There's no gimmicks in this business. You got to go out there and, and you do your best all the time. In the bottom left picture here, some of the farmers have come in, they bring their soil in. We teach them how to use the microscope. On the right, the cash crop we started working with last year. We're testing, we're, we're finding out how well our product can go through the different sprayers. And we're figuring out how I can um, screen it better, get it down to a 50, uh, 50 micron or a hundred micron if not. Uh, so right now I've got it down to 200 microns and I'm testing it every day to see what we can get through what they're doing there. So as you can see on the side, I got 12 sport fields. I got a triple A baseball, soccer, rugby, football. I'm now working with farmers, cash crops, orchards, grapes, uh, market gardens. I've got two uh, market gardens. I got two greenhouses. Um, I still do irrigation. I do some landscape lights only when I want to. Uh, we're, I, we got workshops or mic, uh, microscopy, we're mentoring, I'm consulting. I'm enjoying life even more. So I know you might have some questions. So let's have it. Any questions? Well, I'll start out. Sure. Um, I'll start out by saying meeting Elaine Ingham changed my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You sure did. Yeah, it just, just, it, it, you know, and when, when it's been almost 20 years since I met her and took her courses and everything, but um, I had no idea what was going on in the soil. <laughs> Absolutely no idea. And neither did anybody else. No. But I, have, no. I have a book here from 1986. I took a turf course at uh, Guelph University, turf management course there. And in there, we talked about nematodes. I hadn't seen a nematode until I got a microscope right. <laughs> in 2015. <laughs> and ciliates, as you mentioned, or um, any protozoa, or uh, a tardigrade, you know, the water bear. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Or, there's so much that we just don't know. And then there's beetles that I save in my pool all the time that are seed eaters, specifically crabgrass uh, seed eaters. So mm -hmm. I save those beetles. My wife goes, what are you doing? I'm saving a beetle. They're gonna eat my crabgrass when you eat seeds. Yeah. I, one of my favorite uh, microscopic uh, photographs I've seen would be a, um, a nematode being trapped by a fungi hyphae. I've got one of them. We saw one in 2016. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then on the other side, there's the, the reverse happens where with a nematode. There's certain nematodes that are smaller and they slip through and and they, they're more of a beneficial one. So nature does a lot of amazing things. So, so it does. And the thing is like this picture is in front of my barn, my mm -hmm. office, it's right directly out here. That's a one-to-one -one ratio. We want to try and get that up. And one to one, I mean, is um, biomass ratio is the fungus in relationship to bacteria. Obviously bacteria is smaller and there's gonna be more of them. So if I'm 200 pounds and you're 180 and you happen to be the fungus and I happen to be bacteria, you gotta gain 20 pounds to become that one-to-one -one ratio to create that equal for the nutrient cycling. 
Now, the fungus is king in the soil, and the fungus is what holds on to your calcium too. So if you're putting calcium on, uh, and there's no fungus there, it's just going to migrate out because it just can't get in the middle of the the, the clay pens. It, it it just can't get in there, and it's the fungus that'll get through, open it, and now hold on to your calcium, and that's when the flocculation will start happening. Mm, yeah, and when you're you know, it, like you said, it's a one-to-one -one ratio with, with turf grass and everything, but when you get into, you know, woody ornamentals, you need a higher uh, fungal ratio. Grapes are 10 to 1. We're looking at 10 to 1. And they're right here on these uh, or the vineyards, even the orchards, they're a 0 to 1. They wonder why they have so many inputs. There's no organic matter, which is carbon. So that's why we put some humic on. Now, fulvic, right. I use with my sprays. If you're using herbicides, uh, you can put some fulvic in, you can reduce your herbicide use by 30% at any one time. It'll drop through the leaf and get it in, and then you'll get a better dieback. Right. Uh, but what I use it for is to get my product in, into the leaf, and I, we yep. coat, so we inoculate the leaf. Yeah, and that, that's a good point. It's, you know, we, we do sell uh, fulvic acid, and it, it, it's... It's not really talked about that much in the you know conventional circles, and it's you know, a lot of times when I when I am talking about it, you know there are people who understand and they'll try it, but you know most people aren't aware of it, and you know it sounds like a, a crazy thing. So, but it, it's it it can get you much better results. It can get you a lot of results. And then understand this, when we, I was taking the course with Nicole Masters, um, she would tell me humic for humus, fulvic for foliar. So if you're doing a foliar spray, always use your fulvic. And if you're looking at building humus for soil, but I put both in. And what I try to do, um, if I'm mixing a calcium nitrate, which is a granular, I liquefy it. I take a kilogram, which is 2.2 pounds, per hectare, which is 109,000 square feet. I'll put it in a container. I'll mix it water with some humic and I'll put my lab lactospacillus in with it. And then the, those lactospacillus will start converting the nitrates into amino acids, which means the plant can accept it without all excess, uh, excessive energy to convert it itself and utilize it right away as a nitrogen source. And the thing, I do that 24 hours ahead and then I mix it the next day with my product. Not all of it is converted, but at the same time, you're not using much. I've created another one out here, like I say, with uh, rice water and uh, grass seed. So we're gonna see what we can get out of that. And when we spray, lactospacillus can break down your thatch quicker, can get rid of smells. So if you've got someone with artificial grass, which you don't want, because it's got forever chemicals in there and everything else, and if you got dog smells, you could just use some lactobacillus. It'll get rid of everything and clean it all up. So we got one question here, um, sure. not in the chat, but uh, we have Ellen who has raised her hand. So Ellen, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. You're, you're on that, you're muted. No. Oh, there we go. It, 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 I'm sorry. It would not let me unmute. And I have to apologize for joining late. I had oh. other stuff going on. Um, but what I did catch was wonderful. And um, so I have a, a couple, like a comment and a question. And so unfortunately, I'm probably one of the most chemically injured people you're going to meet um, from lawn pesticides. So I've been poisoned over 30 times from neighbors use of pesticides. And also I lived on a condo property where they assured us for years how safe the product was as they did to you as well, Mike. Um, but, you know, I did a lot of activism for about 30 years and, and you know, got into the whole, all the laws that in the bylaws in Canada. And so I was under the impression that Ontario had banned cosmetic pesticide use and so I don't understand what you're saying that people are using pesticides in lawn care in Ontario. And I know in Quebec, the ban is even stronger. So if you can sort of clarify that, um, 
that would be helpful sure. uh, to me. And also, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, as I see all this grass, because, you know, for me, grass is, it's like the worst enemy in a lot of levels. And I appreciate that some people want to have grass, but I'm just kind of wondering if you also ever work with people to, you know, do things like flowering lawns, uh, perennial beds, growing food. I'm not talking about the, well, maybe I am even talking about a commercial property. You know, do the, are you ever, um, or did I miss that part, working another aesthetic, um, you know, to create that as the norm? And, and you know, and obviously using all that brilliant Elaine Ingham and your brilliant um, work on, you know, regenerating the soil. Sure, so with the herbicides or insecticides, it's easy enough to go across the river and the consumer themselves, there's some lawn care guys, they're doing it too. They pick up a jug over there and they bring it back. They just sneak it across um, Saskatchewan and I think Alberta, they ship it in by UPS. Uh, so there are ways of getting chemical. I don't do it. And I don't use Fiesta either. I just don't like the, the chemical itself anymore or any of it. So I won't use any of that. So if I cost, my customers have weeds, I've got to be brilliant about it and try to figure out how to switch that soil over and, or like as Chip said, overseed, get the seed in there, some aeration, yeah. Yeah. again, get that soil active. Now with, um, so yeah, you're right, 2009 was a ban, but still there's people out there going across the river. And again- Are, are there any people who like, because, you know, when you were saying Chemlon, you know, you, you can't really be Chemlon still, I'm assuming, in Ontario, right? No, they, they changed their name to True Green. Well, I know they're True Green, but. <laughs> yeah, and they're, they're True Green. And I, I have their, they're the top 10, I mean, of the 100 companies making over 400 million a year. In, uh, but how can they, how can they, quote unquote, practice in Canada, in Ontario, if there's a ban? And because I know. I mean, I have the um, Community uh, Action Works, you know, 120 sure. page report on what they use back in the day. And I've been poisoned by their pesticide. They're using neonics, they're using um, cyfluthrin, they're using a whole bunch of stuff yeah. down here. So isn't that illegal for them to do that in Ontario? No, because they have Fiesta registered as a herbicide here. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna interrupt. It's, it's, it's good information, but... Um, it, the focus of these webinars is to help people understand to get away from that. So, yeah. you know, we know there's problems out there. I don't think we have to discuss it in detail. It's more important to spend the time on, you know, learning from each other and how to change it. So, uh, Mike, for a typical landscape company who's been doing these things traditionally, what do you think is the best way a successful way to get at least some of them to start looking at things differently and how it's good business for them and healthier. You got me stumped there. I've talked to them all and they just, they're old dogs. Um, they should know how to learn a new trick, but they just don't want to do that. Uh, well, what they will do and again, they use herbicides. They have other products for their insecticides here. Um, but the thing was, they'll upsell you on kelp. They'll upsell you on wine. They'll upsell you on, or they'll say they're, uh, we, you guys talked about uh, greenwashing. Yeah. They, they greenwash all mm -hmm. over the place um, just to sell you. They, again, they're using that moron approach in a different style. Um, they're using that marketing. How do I get to, to them? Again, you just plant the seed, you be the leader mm -hmm. and you show them that it can be done. And, you know, I've yeah. got, my wineries are Gretzky, Trias, Peller, River Bend. The, the four of those plus uh, flat, flat Rock, mm -hmm. we've got over half a million square feet of turf. Yeah, I, when I speak to landscapers, it's, um, <laughs> again, I, I don't, even mention anything that I think they're doing wrong. I'll, I'll present it in a way there are these other options and it opens up a whole other market to you because more and more people are asking for these services. They're asking for them. And, and as such, 
in this area, we don't get too many people asking to get rid of their turf. Okay, They're, the turf is here for homes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do get into a market garden where we put in, uh, wildflower strips in. I do that. Uh, I got a market garden. I take care of that. I take care of greenhouses. So the thing is, with if you go regenerative, regenerative both it uses conventional methods smartly, and at the same time organic. And the regenerative part of it is that you've got to get the momentum of the soil health moving right. forward. There's right. no negative impact. If there is, you've got to come back and put life back in there to, you know, Goldilocks it. Um, right. So when you talk to landscapers, it's too deep for the ones who don't know. And it took me how many years to get here where I'm at. So my son is now at Trent University. He's taking a bachelor's of science first year. And he disliked the course for the fact that it was shoving conventional shit that, sorry, down his throat. <laughs> and he hears me and he, and he sees what we're doing. And he's out in his market garden. We've got a huge one here. And we're, we're going through our asparagus right now. We're getting the strawberries, the grapes. Um, long and short, if you go regenerative, even in lawn care, it opens up the door. I do so many trees now, shrubs, flower beds, gardens. We extend, we go from um, east, west, south, all over on, our, on the person's lawn. We just don't do the lawn. We do everything now. We encompass everything. So when you go regenerative, it, it opens up the pocketbook even further and you're a one-stop shop now for a lot of them other than i don't cut i don't cut the grass that's i cut my good own for you that's good for you <laughs> so we've got another question here in the chat and uh it's from team cook and it says what's the biggest obstacle to managing customer expectations well one it's education you've got i've got to communicate with them now soon as someone calls or they're on there they, they want a weed dead cut that conversation short there's a tire kicker there and tell them to go back to weed man camelon two green whatever all those other companies they're there you just don't need that hassle literally cut it short and move on um like i say the accounts come up pretty easy now we do get these customers who come on and try us for a year i don't like that for the fact that I wasted all that time and life on that guy's soil to go back to fertilizer. So I try to do my best. And then the thing is that you've got to figure out an outcome that will both be beneficial for you and them. So if it means now that I've got this uh, pelletized compost, the, the bag um, is does 4,000 square feet. I charge 8650 to put it on. And today, I put 30 bags on multiple homes and I'll do 30 tomorrow, 30 the next day. Um, you can see it'll add up. I'm doing close to two grand a day. You know, at the end of the week, 10,000. I got three weeks of work and then I'm into my irrigation. Don't waste your time on people who are, yeah, tire yeah. kickers or yeah, it, it's just aggravating. You just want to, and there's no magic wand. <laughs> you can converse with those people either just plant a seed saying i'm always here when you need me you can give me a shout email i'll always answer your questions yeah yeah i agree 100 percent. You, you get rid of a lot of aggravation internally yeah. that way and everything. well the thing is if you have someone in your front office like i do and i only have them there for five hours a day from 11 to 4 you don't want her or him to go through that aggravation either because that person could be calling complaining but right. you might as well fire the customer and say, I I'm better off without you. How was that, Team Cook? Good. <laughs> yeah, it, it's hard. It, it, it's education. You really got to educate the people. And there's no one way of talking to one person. As you can right. see, the, the plan is very diverse. What we see on the news is especially if you're living in a condo complex, I call that schizophrenia. You walk into a condo complex, you've got uh, 20 units, two people a unit, you've got 80 people coming out, you're 40, 80 people, and they all have a, an expectation. That's schizophrenia. I just don't do condo uh, complexes. I try to get in and communicate with them. They don't want that. They just want the cheapest price. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you pick your battles. 
Absolutely. So we're at the, the end. I'm going to, uh, Mike, thank you very much. There's a lot of information there, great stuff. Um, and you don't mind if we call you every day asking questions, right? Not at all. You don't see, uh, I put my phone over there. <laughs> you can email. You, you can fool, email. you fool. <laughs> the, so, um, we, we do have that Facebook page if you want to put it up there for them. And if they want to go on there, we can converse more on that too for the Regenerative Lawn Care Facebook page. Right, good. I didn't put it on there, sorry. So I'm, I'm gonna do a little advertising. Uh, you know, we're talking about building the soils and you know, some of the products we offer do that exactly. One of my favorite ones, it's, it's, it's a granular form of, of composted worm casting. You can put it in a, just a regular spreader. You don't need a top dress or anything. Um, five to 10 pounds per thousand square foot. It really will turn, um, the soil around and build up the biology and better better turf grass growing. Um, some of the liquids we have are combinations of um, one of them is called Triforce, and it's Triforce because it it contains not only the microbes, the bacteria, and the fungi, but it also includes food for them, so they can get off to a really good start. Um, Fulvic acid, yucca is good, um, and there's more. So <laughs> visit our visit our website and uh, you know look under our uh, uh, our soil amendments there. If anything, Barry, you should they should start using more yucca and uh, fulvic together. Yeah, the yucca right. is really good in kelp. Yep, yep. I'm, I'm, fish. Yeah, one one product we're going to be testing this year is is uh, actually made from from you know, fish, fish, fish waste. Okay. <laughs> um, squid juice. <laughs> we got a product up here called squid juice that I'm working with. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Comes out of Massachusetts. It's a byproduct of the squid industry. And it's got chitin in it, which is good. But again, you right. know, you get chitin in a lot of other things too. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because this, this source I have is also from Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> Big fish industry there. <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. Okay, uh, last chance for questions. I think Rachel wanted to know what a market garden was. Huh? So Rachel, market garden is basically um, any garden that you're actually doing production to sell. So we'll have uh, different types of peppers. We got 20 different types of peppers. 20 different types of uh, tomato plants. We got grapes, we got herbs, uh, we got garlic. So you're basically creating a grocery store out there and you're selling it to the local community or what we're doing is we're setting it up with restaurants right now. So we go in with some of our product to the chefs locally and we start introducing them. Now when you do regenerative and you follow your soil and you put yucca, the kelp, the fish, uh, humic, fulvic, you start building that good stuff back in there. Once the bricks levels start getting up over six, the secondary metabolites kick in, you get better flavors. When you get up into the teens, you get no insects. And what happens is the chefs are looking for that. You've got a whole new market. And that's why I say you, lawn care is the easiest avenue to step, put your fingers in so many different pies because you got the truck, you got the sprayer, you can go anywhere. Uh, you've got the knowledge, soil is here, and it grows any other plant. So in the market garden, I work with, again, a market garden in Niagara Falls area. Uh, we've got 10,000 square feet up there, two greenhouses, and we got some great lettuces coming out of there. Uh, and we use a bit of sugar. So we use uh, a bit of sugar to increase the bricks, but it, it, it creates that flavors again. And oh, my wife just doesn't stop going to get it now. We're out there weekly just picking up their lettuce, mixed lettuce and uh, our grula. What I forget that word. I just eat whatever she puts in front of me. Arugula. <laughs> Arugula. Arugula. There it is. <laughs> Arugula. Yeah. And that's where we put the wildflowers. Yeah. We got nice. a whole wildflower area up there. We try to get the bees to come in. Um, yeah. So good. Sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, again, thank you, everyone. Have a good thank night, you. and hopefully we'll see you next week. Never okay. hesitate to ask a question, please. All right, great. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.